staan hier buiten het Rijksmuseum. De grootste collectie van Nederlandse kunst, cultuur en geschiedenis van al Nederland. Hier naar de kaart van Amsterdam. Binnen zijn de grootste winkelwerken van de Nederlandse Gouden Nieuw. Frans Hals, Jan Steen, Antonius van der Helst, Johannes Vermeer. En de beroemdste van allemaal, Rembrandt. Your accent is terrible. So, I may have hinted in previous episodes that I had ties to the Netherlands. And I think that veel Nederlandse acteurs leven deze films op. Doe dat speel zoals veel van Alanya. En nog iets. But I don't think I ever really talked about my experience with it. My family moved here when I was 11, and this is the country where I came of age. This is where I lived, these are the people who raised me, this is where I went to school, this is where I hung out on the weekends, this is where I first got drunk and felt a boob. A lot of memories. I wouldn't say I was completely immersed in Dutch culture. I grew up with other expatriates rather than native Nederlanders, but my family has called this place home for nearly 15 years. My family's moving back to America, so really, this will be the last time I'll get spent here for quite some time. So while I'm here, what can I talk about that's Dutch? Peter Greenaway, who is British. Shut up, hear me out. You might remember Greenaway from my old, old episode on Prospero's books. He's the pissing cherub guy. Yes, he was born in Wales, but Peter Greenaway has very strong ties to the Netherlands. He was trained as a painter and grew up in love with Dutch culture, and in particular, Dutch painting. You can see it in his films. The Draftman's contract is about art and has a Dutch character. A Zed and Two Knots has a useless subplot about Vermeer. The cook, the thief, his wife, her lover has a gigantic Franz Hals painting looming over it. But none of his movies were necessarily about the Dutch or painters. He was an obsessive who was denying his obsession for decades. And so he finally gave in and said, all right, fine, I'll make a movie about a Dutch painter. And so he made a movie about the greatest Dutch painter of all. I just earned the ire of every Van Gogh fangirl in the world. Night Watching is the story of Rembrandt van Rijn and his work on arguably his most famous painting, De Nachtvacht, The Night Watch. Haha, <laughs> no. The film was made in partial collaboration with the Rijksmuseum as part of his ongoing project, Nine Classic Paintings Revisited, a project which included a video installation along with the film, all made during the 2006 year long country wide celebration of Rembrandt's 400th birthday. Rembrandt Harmanzoon van Rijn was born here, in Leiden, July the 15th, 1606. A miller's son, his parents placed an importance on his education, enrolling him at the University of Leiden. Displeased with the program, he took up art instead, apprenticing for Jakob von Swanenberch, and then stuff happened and he made the night watch. Okay, the movie tells you the basics of what happened. In 1642, Rembrandt was hugely wealthy, with a pregnant wife and a beautiful big home in Amsterdam, enjoying life as the most celebrated portraitist in the richest city in Europe. His work was always on display, and would be for the next four centuries. Which is why Doctor Who didn't do an episode about him. Thank you, sir. In that year, he was commissioned to paint a group portrait of the wealthiest members of the militia of District 2 of Amsterdam, under the command of Captain Franz Banning Koch. Stop giggling and his lieutenant Willem van Reutenberch. After completing it, his wife succumbed to illness and died. Upon sorrow came humiliation, as it is said that the militia hated the painting. Rembrandt's career peaked and his commissions dried up. Most art historians assume that it was because tastes changed, and that Rembrandt's style was simply out of fashion. But Greenaway thought about that moment in the artist's life and began to wonder, what if tastes didn't change? What if Rembrandt's career wasn't stagnated, but destroyed? Did Rembrandt anger the wrong people? Dig too deep? Ask the wrong questions? Did Rembrandt von Rhein discover a conspiracy? To murder? No. No, he didn't. But it's a fun little thought experiment nonetheless. The film postulates that while working with the militia, he discovered all kinds of dirt on his subjects. Dirt like prostitution, conspiracy, and yes, murder. And the Night Watch, famous throughout the world and recreated in postcard, in metal, and in life, was in reality a muckraking satire and an accusation. I accuse you gentlemen of murder. And yes, Rembrandt is played by Martin Freeman. Played by Martin Freeman as an affable everyman caught amidst powerful forces and dominant personalities, getting through it all through cheeky subversion and sardonic wit. He's rather good at those. Admittedly, Freeman isn't great with all of Greenaway's dialogue. Greenaway's Rembrandt is written as intelligent, but lewd and cheeky. 
and he's fine in those bits. Is he? I know, I know your blood is red. Do I remember uh, your eyes are blue? I suspect your piss is yellow. But he's also given that overly classical stuff that Greenway is fond of writing, but actors are not fond of saying. I've been seeing the night. I, I was watching the night. I was looking into darkness, darkness without ending. I was watching darkness. I was watching the night. I was night watching. Must jam title into movie. But justifying the title is necessary. The Night Watch got its name not because it was set at night, and it isn't, but because it had such a dark varnish. Rembrandt never called it the Night Watch. He called it the Company of Franz Banning Cock. I said stop giggling. And this image, naturally, dominates the film. Over all else. Greenaway was never concerned much about plot or character. He focuses on image. Obnoxiously so. And in typical green away y green a green away green away in green a wench green a green a his style, the movie is shot to look like a 17th century Dutch painting, namely Rembrandt's painting, which makes too much sense. People from his life take on the poses used in his paintings, often the people who likely modeled for those paintings. This includes, of course, the Night Watch themselves. And it successfully manages to homage Rembrandt's style without turning into this. The Living Classics pageant, an Orange County tradition, consists of live representations of classic works of art. Part of that is because Rembrandt's paintings are inherently cinematic. They're all about controlling light and space. For example, take this lighting setup. It's common to portrait photography and filmmaking, and it's called Rembrandt lighting. And that's a term coined by a filmmaker. And no less a filmmaker than Cecil B. DeMille. The references lead to some odd bits of irony when art imitates other art. Look the way you've done him up! He looks like a, a clown in a Commedia dell'arte thought! How dare you paint us to look like that as we stand here looking exactly like that! None of this is realistic, of course. It's all shot on sets, not locations. Turning real locations into stages. Look at Rembrandt's house, for example. No, really, look at Rembrandt's house. See? See there? That's it. See, you can do those things when you're on location. I mean, it's so neat. The Rembrandt house in the film is this big, spacious, roomy soundstage full of arches and such. The actual house is big, but its rooms are smaller and cozier, uh, domestically inviting. Kazelach might be the right word. Kazelach. Dutch fans are going to eat this episode up. And of course, it's not the Rembrandt house, it's a representation of the Rembrandt house. It's a painting, and shot like one. And not quite shot like a movie. His distaste for traditional cinematic language makes following the plot a bit difficult. Which is frustrating considering he's doing a murder mystery. And one with all the complexities and detail that comes with it. Let me try to sum up what I gathered from multiple screenings of the film. Ben and Cock wanted to be in a position to power once the English stewards arrived at the Crown Jewel so they could have the wealth and prestige of meeting them. Pierce Hasselberg was the commander at the time, so they had to be gotten rid of, along with Lieutenant Egremont. So Ben and Cock and von Reutenberch, whom he had a big, literally gay crush on, worked with Ron Brown Kent, who was running an orphanage as his own child prostitution ring, to provide a shooter. The shooter was a young boy named Eichen who was in love with one of the child prostitutes, Marita. Kemp got the boy to do it by throwing a pot of boiling water in her face, scarring her for life, and threatening to do the same thing to her sister, Marika. Assigning Egremont to a far off post, they went to a training field, had Eichen fire a musket, which was pushed at the last second, causing him to shoot Hasselberg through the right eye in a staged military accident. He's dead! The bullet then traveled through time to hit Kennedy after being bribed by the Mafia and Fidel Castro, then killed Lincoln for good measure after finding out that Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln. The Bannoncocks then went to New Amsterdam and told people to make sure that 9-11 would happen 300 years later, but not before consulting their lizard people masters and summoning Senator Al Franken to train an army of child soldiers beneath Graceland! Whoa! Um, sorry. Train of thought took me to some really weird shortcuts. I mean, it's true that Al Franken is raising an army of child soldiers beneath Graceland, but it's certainly not relevant. Speaking of... child prostitution? When this is the child? Only I'm nine now. Only yeah, I'm nine now. Nine now. Child prostitution? Wait. I need bigger air quotes. Chai... Knockoff brand Amanda Seyfried is playing the painting's mysterious golden child, who is no more than nine, and just declared a major. 
The Golden Child has been the subject of a lot of speculation. Scholars have long questioned who she was, guessing at an allegorical figure, a daughter of one of the soldiers, or, as the Rijksmuseum declares, the company mascot. Greenaway speculates that she is a child prostitute and the illegitimate daughter of this guy. And it's Rembrandt's relationship with the girl that starts as muckraking. He starts interviewing his subjects, asking his maids to dig up dirt, going out into the hills to test out the muskets that kill... Hills. Hills! Hills! In Holland! More interesting are his personal relationships. First with his wife, Saskia von Uhlenberg, then his lovers, Hirte Dertz and Hendrika Stoffels. Fitting, since in the story it's his lust that brings his downfall. Image-obsessed Protestants wouldn't stand a fornicator. And, yes, you get to see Martin Freeman's Bilbo and Baggins. Of course, a lot of this narrative is bogus. He wasn't exactly ruined by the painting. The militia paid 1,600 guilders for the Night Watch, but Rembrandt got 2,400 guilders for a commission from the Prince of Orange just a few years later. But the tortured genius ruined by a society that doesn't understand him is a good story. The idea plays better with our current understanding of genius. A similar story was told in the 1936 movie, where Charles Lawton played Rembrandt, all grumpiness and great insight. Oh yes, I remember you now. Wasn't there some scandal about the picture you painted for the Civic Guard? I hope you've learned how to behave properly. I can't behave properly. I can't beg properly. I can't paint properly. But I can live my life properly. Freeman's Rembrandt is... different. Fuck off! Fuck off! Fucking queer, fat Polish cunt! Fuck! But in the Lawton version, he was in decline because of scandal and grief. Here, it's because of scandal and conspiracy to libel. And so Rembrandt's sexuality is heavily played up. Lawton was comparatively practically chaste. Greenaway tends to be a bit more liberated with sexuality. <laughs> Tumblr, here's a freebie. <laughs> You're welcome. But as a dramatization, it fails to grab your attention. But it tries. The entire epilogue is basically Jakob de Roy. I actually had to look up his name. He's that much of a non-entity. Giving a whole lecture pointing out everything hidden in the painting that we might have missed. Like a college art teacher. But it says little about the rest of the movie. With this, it seemed like Greenaway was more interested in retelling the story of his much earlier Draftman's contract, which is also about an artist who discovers a murder and gets blinded. I'm blind! Oh! Rembrandt, by the way, was not blinded. But here, Rembrandt's story would have been better as a romance and a character study, as per the earlier Charles Lawton Rembrandt. Greenaway's story works better as an art history documentary. And so, Peter Greenaway made an art history documentary. This building is the Rice Museum in Amsterdam, Holland. And this picture in picture makes me look like Jambi the Genie. Mecca lecca hi, mecca hi ni ho. Again, I'm so glad that I can do this on location. I mean, I'm talking about the museum and it's right there and... Man, I need to get out more. An accusation, a pointed finger, a zakuz. Rembrandt's zakuz. Second verse, same as the first, really. Only now, the guise of fiction is gone, and it's presented as an inquiry, a prosecution. It's like a criminal justice system, where the story is represented in two separate but equally important films, the first of which investigates the crime, and the second which prosecutes it. These are their stories. Not even joking, the movie has its own dun-dun sound. Let's be honest, this didn't happen. It's as likely as Shakespeare writing Romeo and Juliet while dating a noble girl, or Mozart composing the Requiem because he was emotionally blackmailed by Salieri. And if it did happen, Rembrandt wouldn't have told him that he was mocking them like this. I accuse you, gentlemen, of murder. I have subtly painted my accusation against you, so allow me to very unsubtly declare my accusation against you. I mean, um, how does subterfuge work? Still, for the most part, it's fascinating. Rembrandt Chacuse explains the plot of the movie better than the narrative, while providing more detailed insight into Dutch Golden Age painting. Like how the painting itself was a break with the genre of group military portraits. Compare it to this painting by Franz Hals. It's ornate, but static. Everyone can be seen clearly, 
dressed in their finest, each one with a distinct presence. Unlike Rembrandt's busy, obscure route, this shows off wealth, power, and indulgence. Which might be why it showed up in that other movie about class and eating. And it also goes into why Rembrandt might have broken with this tradition. Over the years developed a format of rows of identifiable portraits, all full frontal, faces to the viewer, exhibiting their wealth and status. I want to draw everyone beforehand. That's essential. And I'm not doing long rows of pompous faces. Quite a lot to say about a painting that was finished six years after the film is set. Shakuse is a great insight into the art of that era, and all the subtleties therein. It also goes into why Ben and Cox's shadow is fondling Reutenberch's nuts. If the hand does not indicate its own purpose and desire, may not its shadow, its surrogate, do so. Heh <laughs> balls. The basic argument is plausible, at least. We're taking through 34 aspects of the painting that supposedly reveal the plot by the Manning Cox. The plot being... Are you doing this again? Alright. <clears throat> the background suggests an archway which is found nowhere in Amsterdam save for stage plays, suggesting they were merely playing the parts of soldiers. They're portrayed as a rabble, clumsily holding muskets, lacking any kind of formation or training. Bending Clock's glove refers to an earlier portrait Rembrandt did for his relative, which he had to sue to get paid for, showing him picking up the metaphorical glove that Rembrandt threw. Roydenberg has a big spear over his wang, suggesting that he's a manslut. Bending Clock's shadow is reaching for his lieutenant's wang. Reich is there hiding his sister's scarred face. Kemp points to her, showing his connection. Deroy, the whistleblower, stares at the viewer, knowing more than the rest of them. Paul is barefoot on the cover of Abbey Road, and the cover for Sergeant Pepper suggests a funeral. There's a monster at the cathedral because Van Gogh can see aliens and oh my god, Jesus had kids! Also, if you look closely, you can see a sailboat. It works well as a set of annotations to back up the argument, pointing out subtle things in the movie that might have gone over your head. Like, say, the anti-Catholic bigotry. Is that what we're meant to be? I thought we were in Bethlehem. There were Romans in Bethlehem? There was Romans everywhere, it's like now. I'm not playing a Roman Catholic, you never said we were Roman Catholic. It was huge in Holland at the time, especially in art. A few decades earlier, the Dutch, being Protestants, threw off Catholic Spanish oppression and incited a huge wave of anti-Catholic art vandalism. It was called the Balen Storm, literally the Statue Storm. A huge wave of anti-Catholic vandalism all across the country. Statues of saints and the Virgin Marys are smashed to bits. And churches like this one, the Peterskirk in Leiden, used to have stained glass windows. And now, they're all clear. And keeping in mind that the Thirty Years' War had yet to end in 1642, that hatred was still there. A republic tempered by assassination is not the Dutch way. We do not assassinate like this, like, like Italians, like Romans. Or do we? The stereotype of Italy as a hot-headed land of shady politics was still young, and so it would have been quite a statement to paint the Dutch militia in an Italian style. The use of shadows here is much more Caravaggio than Brochel. Greenaway is suggesting that it's like doing a biopic of Barack Obama and then scoring it with the music of Omar Khairat. Insert massive eye-rolling from me here. But are we missing something? It seems a stretch from xenophobic political mudslinging to accusation of murder. Well, according to Greenaway, if it's a stretch, then it's your fault. You're just not visually literate. Most people are visually illiterate. Why should it be otherwise? We have a text-based culture. Our educational systems teach us to value text over image, which is one of the reasons why we have such an impoverished cinema. Oh, come on. Overeducated people are supposed to complain that people don't read enough. It's pompous as it is, but it's annoying when he's clearly wrong. He says that this guy's Oakleys are code for the shooter's name. Horatio Aiken. Oak. Oak leaves. When actually it's far more likely that he's an allegory for civil service. In ancient Rome, a crown of oak leaves was given as a military decoration. Also, in one moment, he calls Reutenberch a dude skank. Of William's excessive phallic exhibitionism. A painted demonstration of his womanizing. And in the next moment, he calls him Jesus Christ being led to temptation by the devil. Cock as Satan, the man in black, is dressed as a civilian, though he is really only a citizen in disguise, hiding his iron military gorget beneath his lace collar. Whilst Willem as Christ is undisguisably a soldier, the soldier who was the risen Christ, resplendent in white and yellow and 
cream. So Ben and Cock and Van Reutenberg are gay Roman Satan and horny pimp Jesus. Oh my god, Jesus did have kids! Plus, there are parts where... Hmm, how do I put this? You know how in high school you wrote essays where you had to add a meaningless paragraph or two to get your dumb paper up to eight pages? Might we suggest that Rembrandt was being prophetic and making an apocryphal reference to the savage assassinations of the brothers de Witt in The Hague in 1672, and even, perhaps, the murder of Pym for town in 2002 in a media park in Hilversum, and much closer to home, the assassination of Theo van Gogh in 2004. And in the story of Jane Eyre, we can see parallels to Batman. Because like Mr. Rochester, he is rich and sad, and his house burns down. Also, he's visually literate, but computer illiterate. Unless he thinks Photoshop filters are the height of visual literacy. This one is called airbrush. This one is called extract. This one is called line drawing. See how visually literate I am? Also, if Rembrandt painted them in Italian style, as if it was a moment of theater, then it's the malicious fault for hiring him in the first place. Wasn't the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp pretty much just that? And what's more, the painting was not poorly received. It was always on public display, Ben and Cock had a watercolor copy made of it for his personal collection, and there was no record anywhere of a piece of contemporary negative criticism against it. The whole premise of both movies is completely false but it succeeds in getting you to pay close attention to the painting. Even flawed information can lead one to better information, assuming you have a curious mind. And even with the dodgy insights, keep in mind that this was done in collaboration with the Rijksmuseum. If that's not a tacit endorsement, I don't know what is. It builds up the painting's mystique, and makes you think about the image more closely than you might have. It certainly led me to more than I ever thought I would know about the customs and politics of Dutch Golden Age art, a revelation of the tepid narrative's true potential. Which leads to the big question, which movie is true? One is a narrative and the other a documentary. If the conspiracy happened, then one is fact, the other is fiction. If it didn't, then fact and fiction are reversed. It doesn't help that the movie works in circular logic. Statement made in the narrative, backed up by elaboration in the doc. Statement made in the doc? Here's a clip from the narrative to prove it! And on that note, Al Franken is bringing an army of child soldiers beneath Graceland. And there's proof! It's true that Al Franken is raising an army of child soldiers beneath Graceland. See? That's a clip of something. That means I'm right. I need to deeply apologize to some jerk with a camera for stealing that joke. But that's why I chose to do these two movies as one episode. They work better as a pair than as individual features. They build off each other as an enclosed idea, not unlike a piece done by a very different Dutch artist. Together, Night Watching and Rembrandt's Accuse form a great primer on the medium of painting, an enigmatic fable about authorial intent, and overall, a neat little thought experiment. And even if they don't have the answers, the questions are entertaining enough. And that's pretty good for a movie about a painter that only shows him putting a brush to canvas once. Shame it wasn't by a Dutch director, though. It seems like I'm cheating myself. I mean, here I am, in the Netherlands, and I don't do a movie done by a Dutch director. Honestly, it's because I don't know nearly enough about Dutch cinema. I mean, they do make movies. They have a fine documentary school, there's a Dutch film fund. I mean, I could talk about early Paul Verhoeven, but surely he's so Hollywood. And the highest profile Dutch director in recent years made this. So I eventually decided on a movie about a key figure in Dutch culture, at a grand moment in Dutch history, directed by a foreigner. Cheating, I know, but it's a foreigner who found a home here and loves the culture. I can relate. But by all means, if you know a Dutch movie that would go well with this show, tell me and I'll give it a look. And hopefully by doing this episode, I've given you a representation of Dutch culture that expands beyond... Yeah. Until then, it'll probably be some time before I come back here. This country that formed me. I'm gonna miss this place. Awful windy weather and all. Okay, episode about Rembrandt. How am I gonna play this out?
Michael Less. 